<laughs> I was listening to Dr. Rouse and, and I, the word change he, he kept mentioning and the, the opening remarks that I wanted to make really follow along well with that. Um, you know, no one really knows exactly when or how he said it, but Gandhi somehow, somewhere along the line, said, be the change that you want to see in the world. And that's, to me, what this is really about. And the truth of the matter is, what I've been thinking about graduate students and graduate students at UMBC and how we can get more involved in this, in this movement, um, I think the truth is, is that we already are involved. And you already are involved in your own ways. You might not have named it. You might not have found a connection with uh, a group like us up here. But, but that's really what you're about when you're in graduate school. You're about finding ways to make things better or different or uh, a, a new way of thinking about whatever happens to be in your field. And so one of the things as I was thinking about the graduate school and, and supporting your efforts, um, I wanted us to start really re rethinking how we think about our work, so to speak. So typically uh, when we have conversations like this, it's natural to think about the humanities as, the, as where this kind of work happens in, in public policy or in psychology or, or applied sociology. But at UMBC, um, we have folks doing work that really affects change, um, breaks ground, so to speak, um, in all kinds of fields. For example, biochemistry. There's a professor in biochemistry who's working in Kenya on uh, sanitation and water quality issues, and he's taking undergrad and graduate students with him, partnering with small communities there, I mean villages, really, and the local university to identify a clean water source and find ways to bring sanitation to those communities. That's pretty big. I mean, that's happening across, halfway across the world. But then there are things happening right here in, in the Baltimore area, in Baybrook, for example, in a community that's been devastated by not only environmental um, degradation of their water and air supply, but also the shutting of the steel plant that caused the problem to begin with. But their economic conditions now are, are really of going down. And Steve Bradley and a lot of folks have been working with those communities to kind of reconnect their communities to their history and to their proud history and, and give them a, a chance to kind of re-identify themselves in a way that they didn't think they could. Um, so that's happening five miles away from here. So we have folks doing things in all kinds of ways and, and what I want to encourage you to do is to think about what you can do whether you're researching in a lab or whether you're out in the community testing water quality or whatever it happens to be every single one of you have the opportunity to be the change that you want to see in the world um, things that came up to me as I was thinking about today was um, that we should be connected and not isolated. So when you're in your labs, you know, it feels like a very isolating environment. But if you start connecting with your fellow grad students, um, start speaking with your faculty um, and other graduate students from other disciplines and find ways that you can connect. Maybe you all have similar concerns about whether it's a local community issue or a broader community issue. I think about what's happening, and I'm a lawyer. I don't know a whole lot about this stuff, but I imagine the people in chemistry are working on, on new drugs that can really solve some of um, the ills that we've had, you know, medical, medicinal purposes. Those things are happening here at UMBC. They're happening all over. And connecting is a way to kind of bring it to the next level. And then I was thinking about my cell phone. I was walking in the commons a couple hours ago and every single person was sitting in a circle doing this, right? And I thought the cell phone really started the revolution in Egypt. You know, it was the, 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 um, the Arab Spring started with the technology of a cell phone. So think about just the, the capacity that we have now to, to affect change, whatever that might be, and your role in it. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to solve every problem in the world, but just collectively um, starting at UMBC and the work that you do, uh, we really can go, we can take, take this world to a whole nother level and, and I'm really proud to be part of this. So um, I know Steve you're going to talk a little bit about how to get re more connected here, um, but there are lots of easy 
ability, opportunities for you to get connected here at UMBC on this really important work that we call Breaking Ground. Thank you. So I'm kind of like the example now. And public <laughs> history is really particularly well suited to meet the challenges that were identified by the Breaking Ground Initiative in the first place. So public history is a graduate track here in the, in the Department of History, and we specialize in community-based public history practice. So it's really a form of historical inquiry that values collaborative work and recognizes that history can be a tool for analyzing and addressing contemporary problems. So while the stereotype of the historian remains that historians are objective, that they stay somehow outside of politics. The truth is that public historians really embrace the potential of, his, of the discipline to become an agent of change. So in my experience, one of the most important and sometimes most challenging aspects of teaching public history lies in shifting graduate students perceptions of what historians are supposed to do. So most of the graduate students who come into our track are really well prepared to follow the steps of the historical method. So they develop a question, they trace a historiography, they find primary sources, they, make an, uh, they arrive at a thesis and they construct an argument. And many, many historians have extremely successful and brilliant careers working in this very individualized fashion addressing questions that kind of emerged from the closed conversations of the discipline or originate in their own minds. Public historians really are most effective and most valuable as agents of change when they can work to address questions that come from outside of themselves, outside of the discipline, outside of what they thought they'd be interested in doing, but really arrive from a collaborative space with their audiences and with other stakeholders. So the best public historians really already recognize history as more than just an intellectual pursuit. Done well, it is both creative and politically engaged. So while public historians have to be well trained as historians to go through that traditional method, they really also have to be willing to adapt and sometimes when it's necessary, thoughtfully and carefully discard some of what they thought their methodology should be. So graduate courses in public history here at UMBC really create opportunities for students to practice history as a form of public service. So they share the authority for the development of research questions and for interpretive themes and for public projects with preservationists, with policy makers, with local residents who are engaged in a particularly interesting project, and with others. And this kind of collaborative and reflexive practice produces historical research that is immediately relevant and can be used by our partners, by those external partners, to better understand problems and promote change. When I, when I hear you talking about developing medicines to cure cancer, my personal mantra is I, I'm not curing cancer, so I can calm down a little bit. But I think of myself as trying to empower our partners to, to solve problems on their own. So I'm not always handing them an answer, but I'm giving them tools where they can come up with their own answer. So I received support from the Breaking Ground Initiative in the fall of 2012 to help build a new approach to History 711, which is one of our regular public history track offerings. And it's a topics course that's designed to help our students develop a professional portfolio. And the funds enabled me to accomplish two goals. One was to just provide specific technical training to my graduate students that I knew would make them marketable. Sad but true. And the other was to expand a working partnership that I already had uh, with Baltimore Heritage, a local preservation advocacy organization. Um, in the earlier iteration, we, uh, my students and I had worked to build textual and visual content for a smartphone application, ironically, that Baltimore Heritage is using to connect preservation issues to people who are just walking around the city. You can access the app and find content and images. So those stories ask visitors and residents to recognize the way in which places change over time and to challenge the perception that cities only decay. 
So the Breaking Ground initiative enabled my students to receive training from the New Media Studios faculty in order to produce digital stories for this same smartphone application. And what we did was, at first we looked at critical cultural theory on place. My students took a walking tour of the west side of downtown. They thought about the ways in which city blocks and urban spaces become places. They looked at historic patterns of movement in and out of the west side. They worked to identify and analyze contemporary attitudes toward the neighborhood. And they participated in this annual unconference called Be More Historic, where they were able to interact with local historians and preservationists and history buffs. And they were able to listen and seek advice about their work. So once they'd identified kind of common concerns about the neighborhood, I asked them to consider the ways in which historical narratives might address these problems. How could attention to the past help a neighborhood feel safe and familiar? How can history reconnect a neighborhood to a broader network in the city or the region? How could a story about the past make a series of disconnected blocks achieve a co coherence as a place? So students crafted stories, they found images, and they spent considerable energy transforming historical research into a pointed and poetic narrative uh, for their digital stories. So by the time we reach the end of this, the last portion of the semester, we're really ready to focus on the digital component. And they worked with Christine Ferreira and became really near experts on digital storytelling. So my student, uh, Dorothy Alexander, is going to talk about her experience and the story that she developed for that project. So I am a graduate student in the public, can everyone hear me? No, she's very little. <laughs> I have a small voice. Um, I am in the public history program. I've had the privilege of attending um, a few classes with Dr. Mranglo, including the one last fall. Um, and so last fall, we created digital stories for the Walking Tour app. Um, and we wanted to use our stories to address some of the problems in Baltimore's west side. So as a class, before we started crafting our stories, we came up with a few main issues. Um, poverty, perceptions of safety, isolation, and an absence of a strong community. So I chose the first Mariner Arena, built in 1962 at the Baltimore Civic Center. Um, and I really struggled crafting my story um, around, around my building. I wanted to connect my audience to the place, but I also wanted to address some of these issues. So I started out thinking, um, what was there in that space before the Civic Center was constructed? Um, I found out that there were a variety of merchants, businesses, and even uh, roadways that occupied the site before construction. Um, the city decided to build the center as part of an urban renewal program. Um, they demolished two blocks in the west side for the Civic Center instead of choosing an alternative open space location. Um, and also, early in the semester, I found out that the arena is currently a proposed location for open space and urban park projects. So I wanted to take these two themes, uh, put them together, and really get my audience, audience thinking about how it was a community before, and could this space um, become, could it encourage a sense of community again? Um, so, I, But I realized, with the help from Dr. Wranglow and our partners at Baltimore Heritage, um, that this turned the first Mariner Arena into a building that should be torn down, which is too negative of a message for me. Um, so first of all, many people, they have a connection to the arena already. Um, whether it's through sporting events or concerts. So the arena isn't bad itself. Um, second, if the arena is not torn down, my story would have no useful message. Um, third, by focusing on the story of past communities and the future of the arena, I was ignoring a central theme, um, which were the consequences of urban renewal, um, which is a broader narrative that affects communities across the nation. Um, so I shifted my story to the construction of the Civic Center through the lens of urban renewal and the destruction and displacement that comes with it. Um, so instead of telling a story that offers a solution for some of the problems in the West Side, I hopefully provoke people into thinking about the arena in a way that they aren't used to and also get them questioning urban renewal. And this is the kind of hands-on experience that I really value as a student. Um, I entered this field because I wanted to use history to affect change. I wanted to get people to reconnect to their history. Um, and I feel I was able to do this um, last year through the Breaking Ground Grant and our partnership with Baltimore Heritage. So thank you. Uh, all right, good afternoon, everyone. Everyone, uh, Thanks so much for having me here. And while I have the microphone, I want to take just a moment to say, as someone who was a graduate student about two years ago, it is possible. You can do it. There is life after grad school. Um, you can do it. Uh, uh, so uh, 
As Steve said, my name is Sean Kane. Uh, I am an assistant professor in the Department of Information Systems and associated with the Human Centered uh, Computing Program here at UMBC. Uh, and I want to take uh, just a few minutes to talk about two issues that I think I'm, I'm particularly excited about. One is uh, participation in research or research through participation, but also is the role of creativity uh, in our civic engagement and engagement with, uh, with the, the broader community. Uh, and I wanted to talk just for a minute about uh, human-centered computing and the work that we're doing in our department. Uh, if you haven't heard that term before, or you're wondering what human-centered computing is, is it the same thing as computer science? You know, uh, a lot of the work that we do is overlapping. Um, and uh, UMBC is actually quite remarkable in that we have one of us of a handful of human-centered computing uh, graduate programs in the world. So it's a, it's new and upcoming. I think you'll be hearing a lot more about it in the coming years. Uh, but uh, the way I see the work that we do uh, within the Human Centered Computing Program is looking at uh, understanding and developing technological solutions uh, that meet human needs or human wants. And uh, as you might suspect, this work is really fundamentally participatory. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit about uh, just the kind of work that we do. Uh, my work in particular has been looking at uh, technological solutions for people who have disabilities uh, or chronic health conditions that affect their ability to use technology. And so. I started as a grad student uh, about seven years ago, seven, eight years ago, working with uh, blind individuals in uh, Seattle and looking at how they use technology and turned this into a dissertation and a, and a research thread that continues to uh, this day. Uh, and I want to say a little bit about just how this uh, work has really evolved and how my thinking is involved from thinking about uh, research subjects, I sometimes use this term, now more often we use the term that might be more politically correct of research participants, but really thinking about research moving from subjects to participants to research partners. And uh, so a lot of the work that we're doing is now uh, about building multi-year and really you know, hopefully career-long uh, connections with uh, communities. Uh, our group in particular does a lot of work with uh, various groups who have disabilities uh, in the Baltimore area. So we do a lot of work with the National Federation of the Blind in Baltimore City. Uh, personally, I do a, a lot of work with um, <clears throat> with Kennedy Krieger Institute, and also in Baltimore, and also uh, SCALE, which is the Snyder Center for Aphasia Life Enhancement. Uh, and uh, we're doing a lot of what we might think of as traditional service as well, and, and one thing that, uh, that I've tried to do working with my students is to encourage um, what we might think of tr as traditional service in research. And so, for example, my student, uh, Patrick Carrington, who is right there in the back, hi Patrick, uh, he gave a presentation, presentation this morning. Uh, so his work is looking at technology for wheelchairs, but he is actually starting, uh, hopefully uh, in the next few weeks, working as a physical therapist, working within the gym at Kennedy Krieger to not only get to know participants better, but to really uh, embed himself in the work of what does it mean to uh, be someone with a spinal cord injury and be someone in a wheelchair, and to also to understand the people who work uh, with that group. Uh, an, another student, Lula Albar, has been working teaching a class for individuals who had a stroke and have now um, some cognitive and la uh, language impairment, and this is at the SCALE Center that I mentioned before. Um, and so in our research, we really uh, highly prioritize ways that students and, and faculty and others involved in the research can apply their skills to the community um, and also how we can build these strong partnerships. Uh, and I want you, uh, just one brief anecdote here, uh, and for those of you uh, thinking about what your research is going to be or maybe you're thinking about what kind of uh, community you might want to work with or which group. Um, We've been working with this group of adults who have uh, language disabilities due to stroke, uh, which you might know, refer to as aphasia, for about a year. And uh, I started working with this group, uh, not having done so before, as new faculty here at UMBC. And I went meekly and met with the director of the center and I just had cold called her and was talking about what we do building technology. And um, she was very excited about the research, but she also said, uh, and this is, as a researcher, the thing that you really just, you know, my, my eyes lit up and my heart just swelled three sizes where she said, well, you know, we're really excited to have you because our mem the members of our center, uh, being, being involved in research and working with people in the university is the most exciting thing in, that goes on in their everyday lives because these are individuals who had healthy lives, were successful, now have had an injury where they're no longer able to participate in everyday life as the, uh, and as much as they would like to. Uh, and so now they have an opportunity to be helpful and be useful. 
Um, and so this idea of creativity and collaboration with our research partners is really key to uh, the work that we do. And uh, as part of the Breaking Ground Initiative, we're now planning a new event, in, uh, I'm calling Accessibility Hack Day, which is really looking at bringing together creative types to develop solutions, uh, and in particular to develop a lot of solutions in a short time frame, so about 48 hours, looking at taking on some of the, the challenges that our community partners face. So this will be uh, hopefully in either late April or early May. Uh, we're planning, still finalizing the date. Uh, but any UMBC uh, undergraduate or graduate student is welcome to take part, and what we're looking to do is build project teams to work with these community partners, so uh, National Federation of the Blind, the SCALE, Aphasia Center, Kennedy Krieger, to brainstorm ideas and um, develop uh, solutions in 48 hours, or at least the start of a solution, to solve some creative problem that might actually help people uh, in their everyday lives. And uh, I know this works because a project that I worked on in a similar project a, f uh, a few years ago turned into a research project, an ongoing research project, a research paper that we've received funding for. So these 48-hour, you know, stay up all night drinking Red Bull ideas can turn into valid research. Uh, and you know, really interested in, in leveraging our creative abilities to to make uh, our engagement with the community, not just service, but something creative, something that's going to develop, uh, as allow us to develop as researchers and allow the community to develop alongside us. Hello, everyone. Um, I came to the Breaking Ground project about a year ago as a community liaison for the Graduate Student Association, so I kind of um, was introduced to it uh, just because that was my role in GSA. Um, and it has turned my life upside down since then um, and has also contributed a lot to uh, the direction that GSA is going in right now. So um, this talk, this panel may do the same to you, um, which would be great. So we have heard uh, great things already. and. Um, as a graduate student, when I when I look back to a year ago, I, it was always, oh, I'm so busy, I have to do uh, my research, I need to go to the library, I need to read all these books, and then I need to write my papers. For those of you who are in the sciences, it's the same thing, just that you are in your labs and you do experiments. Um, so, uh, but now it's like, is this really all that graduate students should do? Isn't there more? to graduate education? Shouldn't we be out in the community and put our skills to good use instead of being kind of disconnected? And um, so when I talk to graduate students, I often hear, oh, I don't have time. I will do this after I graduate. Um, and the whole civic engagement or the idea of civic engagement is to connect those things, to connect our time that we spend here, our studies, our research, and our engagement in the community so that it's not two separate things, but that we can um, combine all of those, uh, what, what seems to a lot of us to be separate areas, to come together. And um, so that work is not easy. It takes a lot of commitment, it takes a lot of time, um, and it really pushes boundaries and sometimes it requires us to go even beyond those boundaries. And uh, it's, um, it's also very rewarding. So despite all this extra work, the outcome of it is really great and you get to work with uh, people from different disciplines and um, just really see that we have these disciplinary boundaries, but then people in those disciplines are doing similar research and you can come together and connect and really uh, work on a project together and put your skills into, um, use them for, uh, for the common good. Uh, and also, once you cross those disciplinary boundaries, what happens is that you see that there are a lot of graduate students in different programs that are also uh, interested in doing this kind of work. So um, while this work is difficult, just remember that you are not alone. There are others. and. Uh, 
GSA strives to be a place where graduate students can come and can share their um, experiences and uh, so that we are kind of a way to connect uh, with you and, and put uh, people, graduate students who are interested in this kind of work in touch with one another and create projects and ideas that, that we can work on together. <coughs> um, so I encourage you to think of ways that you can, with your own research, transform it a bit so that it becomes a, um, a publicly engaged research where you're not just um, kind of entering a community, do your research and go out of it, but where you're there and you collaborate and rethink what education is and what, it, what you want to get out of it, but what also the community may need um, or, uh, or wants to get out of, of you coming into their community. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, and then, of course, there's also the coursework. As Dr. Maringolo said, uh, there are some courses already in place at UMBC for graduate students that offer this kind of civic engagement component. Her course is one of them. Uh, we also have courses in language literacy and culture. And um, there are others on campus as well that may have not received the Breaking Ground Fund but it doesn't mean that there are others. So I encourage you to seek out those courses and even if they don't have a civic engagement component yet, talk to the faculty, see maybe we can um, incorporate a civic engagement component and if that's not possible and you kind of hit a wall, that's okay. Just see how your research that you're doing for this course can maybe have a civic engagement component or can start a project that you will then continue. Um, and uh, lastly, to come back to the Graduate Student Association, as I mentioned, we are a great proponent of this um, project we're very deeply involved with it. And um, we also recently received a grant from Breaking Ground for a community engagement project. And um, uh, so it just, we just came together uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and um, it basically allows graduate students to use their skills and to put the theory into practice um, and to do this in a, in an interdisciplinary manner. So there's collaboration, there's innovation, and the specific project is also collaboration with the West Baltimore community. So, uh, and the, um, it's, it's, uh, it sets out to um, answer a community need uh, that exists in, in Picktown, but also to answer the need um, of graduate students to have the ability to use their skills in such an innovative manner. And uh, Charlotte will talk a bit about the project, so I'm gonna pass the mic to her. Hi, my name is Charlotte Keniston. I'm an MFA candidate in the Imaging and Digital Arts program. I moved to Baltimore about 18 months ago to begin my MFA here at UMBC. Never been to Baltimore, knew nothing about it. And I moved into this neighborhood called Pigtown that I quickly learned was a food desert. And that has completely consumed me as a person and as an artist in the last 18 months. And that's really been the focus of my artwork and in, uh, my community engagement work um, over the last 18 months. Um, so I'm here as another example of how civic engagement can work for graduate students. As Romy was talking about, we've received um, a grant to connect the Pigtown neighborhood where I live and work with the graduate students here at UMBC. So through the Breaking Ground Community Building Grant, um, essentially what we'll be doing is connecting UMBC graduate students and all of you are invited and welcome um, to join us. Uh, we will be starting a series of cooking class cooking classes with young people in the neighborhood. So through my community work in Pigtown, um, I began to see this need for, we built a community garden and there were all of these kids coming and wanting to put their hands in the dirt and learn about food. Um, and then they started asking me about cooking food. So I saw this need for um, providing the space for, for kids to get together after school or on the weekends and talk about cooking and nutrition and food justice and what that means in their neighborhood. 
Um, and then Romy and I were talking about um, how we can connect graduate students to do that. And I think that one of the great benefits of being at a school like UMBC is this idea that we can approach social issues with a variety of interdisciplinary responses because we know that social issues can't be tackled or approached from just one entry point. They obviously have you know, lots of different factors that go into them, and food is one of the huge ones that can be approached by a variety of different disciplines. So we've put out a call for graduate students to join us in this, um, and so far we have students from GES, from Imaging and Digital Arts, from Language, Literacy, and Culture, from Psychology, and a variety of other disciplines, people who are interested in food issues, people who want to put feet on their graduate studies and get out into a community and actually see how it works on the ground. Um, and we're really excited. We'll be kicking it off next Thursday evening with a uh, panel here on campus about food justice to kind of get the campus community talking about food justice. And then throughout the semester, we'll have a series of cooking and nutrition classes with kids in the neighborhood, um, where what we'll actually do is we'll develop a meal together, bring a recipe, go shopping together, talk about healthy shopping practices. We'll go back, we will prep the meal, cook the meal, and eat the meal together. And then throughout the course of the four cooking classes, we'll also be talking about container gardening. And each of the students that we're working with will actually be building a container garden, planting seedlings into their container garden. Um, and then they'll take that home for the summer and care for it. And the idea is that this won't be a one-off thing that we'll do this semester through the GSA. Um, but that it would be the beginning of an ongoing relationship between the GSA and the UMBC community and Pigtown, which is one of the closest neighborhoods in Baltimore City to our campus. Something that uh, came to mind while I was listening to the various speakers is um, 2005, I started doing some work in a community it was called the North Avenue Arts District that we know that's really well known today. And when I started working there, I was pretty much by myself with a couple of other artists working in this community. At the time, I didn't even consider approaching colleagues from the university, from UMBC, to join me because I didn't know that at that time that there would be individuals like that are sitting at this table who would have like mind like-minded interest or philosophical underpinnings that education should have or could possibly have some kind of social benefit. And today what's fascinating is that I'm sitting at a table with seven or eight colleagues, students, staff, and um, faculty who are speaking a very similar language even though we're from different disciplines. And I, I think the other piece is having the university um, behind a lot of the initiatives now that I think is has, has making a big difference. And so if, I feel like I've sort of, after 17 years, I've, I've found my home. <laughs> and uh, it's very encouraging. Um, a couple of things I would like to also add is that we have a blog website. It's not exclusive. It is an open forum. It's meant to be yours, your place to communicate the kind of things that you're doing in the university so that we can become a little more familiar with what we're doing, again, even though we're from different disciplines. And that blog can be found on my UMBC's um, interface. So if you go inside of the interface and just type in breaking ground, the blog will pop right up. Um, also, it makes me think that a number of you need to post blogs about uh, the kind of things you're doing so that the public can learn more about it. So again, this is not an exclusive uh, venue. It is, it's a collective venue, and I really want all of you to consider, uh, particularly graduate students, that this is for you as, as much as it is for me as faculty. I'm wondering, is any of you interested in synthesizing any kind of um, hot points that would be worth mentioning? Or maybe the public might have some questions? responses to what was said today? Hmm. Can I see what open up for questions? Yeah. Let's do I just want to say that it's encouraging to see faculty and students getting together to come up with ideas 
and projects that take what we do here <coughs> to the community and reach out to people whom we are essentially here at UMBC learning something so that we can go out and serve and help improve their life and our lives as well. So it's encouraging to see this is happening already at UMBC. It's, as you mentioned, Dr. Uh, uh, T. Bradley, you mentioned that it's important to connect all those um, successful stories that are already going on, bring them all together so that we can share, exchange, and hopefully collaborate in the future and, and more successful projects. So thank you so much. Thank you. That's a great, great. Thank you all very much. Thank you. thank you, GSA, for all your hard work. <laughs>